Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 50, which will be all about plant hydration. Today I'll be talking about how plants seek out and find water, how they absorb it, how they move water through their bodies, and how this water-transporting physiology has evolved over time to create the forms of life that we see in the forests and jungles and grasslands all around us today. The basic premise of plant hydration is that the roots absorb water in the ground, and this water flows through a pressurized system of cellular pipes through the stem, down the branches, to the leaves, where water evaporates and leaves the plant. This passive action of the leaves drying out will pull up more water from the stems and the roots, and this encourages the roots to absorb more water out of the soil. The vascular plants can do this passively, effortlessly, with no need to spend chemical energy fueling the process. The details of this water flow have to do with everything from particular cellular structures to the very laws of physics. Okay, so first, there's a few concepts that I need to introduce and explain before any of the rest of this will make any sense. So the first concept that I want to talk about is one that I've actually mentioned quite a bit on the podcast, like in episode 33 about plants, and in pretty much every episode in the series on ecology and the series on biomes. Transpiration is the formal name for this evaporation of water from the leaves and the herbaceous shoots of plants. The water inside the leaf, or the herbaceous soft tissue of the plant, the water inside will evaporate if the air outside is relatively dry, as this creates a partial pressure difference between the air inside and outside the leaf. It creates a partial pressure difference with regards to H2O vapor. Transpiration is regulated in part by structures that are embedded in the underside of the leaf, in the, uh, in the plant's epidermis and the cuticle, and these structures are called stomata. The stomata are little pores that are created by two cylindrical guard cells pressed together in a parallel arrangement. When these guard cells get filled with water, they expand, and because of the specific arrangement of structural fibers inside of the cells, when they expand, they bend outwards in a boomerang shape. When both of the guard cells are swollen with water and bent outwards, they create an open space between them, which is the mouth of a pore, through which gases like molecular oxygen and water vapor can leave the plant's tissues, and carbon dioxide can come in. Water potential is the second concept I want to touch on, but it's one that I haven't really talked about much. But that's okay, because it's pretty simple and easy to understand. So, if you have pure water that's sitting still at room temperature, it has zero water potential. It's not going anywhere. This is also called zero psi, after the Greek symbol used for water potential. It's the potential for water to flow in any given direction, or to flow at a certain rate. If you have water on a steep incline, instead of being held calm and still in a flat container, if you have water on an incline, it'll have some water potential. Water on an incline will have potential energy like an object that's being held up high in the air, or somewhere where it can fall down. Something that's lying flat on the ground with nowhere to fall in any direction has no potential energy, because it's not going anywhere. But when the water on the incline begins to run downhill, its potential energy turns into kinetic energy, much like an object being dropped and falling to the ground, where its potential energy turns into kinetic energy. And then that kinetic energy eventually gets transferred into mechanical energy as it impacts the ground and disturbs you know, nearby soil or rocks or whatever. In the case of water on an incline, like a hillside or a valley, the water potential will follow the path of least resistance, and the water will flow downhill. In the case of transpiration, the water will only evaporate out of the leaf if the air outside is drier than the air inside the leaf which is the result of a gas exchange that's trying to reach an equilibrium. The last concepts I want to touch on are solute potential and pressure potential. These are also relatively simple concepts to understand. I mean, they're simple concepts, but when you apply them in practice to biological systems, they can very quickly become diverse and complicated. <laughs> 
The solute potential is basically quantifying the net movement of solutes in a solution. If you have a cell with no solutes inside of its body, and you put it into a solution that's full of solutes, like salts or something, then through diffusion, the solutes will try to get into the cell. They'll try to move through the membrane or come through some kind of channel or pore to get inside to create an equilibrium in the solute concentrations between inside and outside the cell. If the solutes can make it through the membrane and the water solute potential reaches equilibrium, well, as all of these solutes came into the cell, they were displacing some of the molecules of water. And so you have this associated water movement that's a reflection of the solute movement. Where solutes will move from high solute concentration to low solute concentration, the water will simultaneously move from high water concentration to low concentration. And as the concentration of solutes increases, the concentration of water decreases. Now, if our theoretical cell membrane is impermeable to these solutes and won't let the solutes come through to find that equilibrium, then water will leave the cell through osmosis to try to bring the solute concentration into equilibrium that way. This will result in the cell shrinking and shriveling, going past a point where its membrane has fatally collapsed and the cell can't be reinflated. It's effectively dead. If the situation was reversed, and the cell had solutes while the solution it was in had no solutes, then the solutes would try to leave the cell to establish that same concentration equilibrium. Water would also come into the cell to try to find that equilibrium that way, and the cell would swell like an overfilled balloon until it burst. To a degree, plants don't have to worry about this because their cells are encased within cell walls, and these cellulose and sometimes lignin-rich cell walls are able to contain the membrane and prevent it from expanding until it pops open. This is where pressure potential gets involved. When the membrane is not fully expanded, it has a low turgor pressure. When it has enough solutes such that the water coming in fills it up, it will have a higher turgor pressure. When the membrane gets so full of water that the cell wall pushes back against the increased pressure in the cell membrane, this is called wall pressure. Plant cells that are turgid are well hydrated. Their cells are stiff and experiencing strong wall pressure. This is why a well hydrated plant will look healthy, firm, and strong, and it'll be holding its branches upright or its leaves upright. Dehydrated plants, on the other hand, have low internal turgor pressure, and so they're limp and flimsy and soft, and the leaves look wilted. This is quantified by the pressure potential. So all of these concepts factor into the process of plant hydration. The roots first have to find water somewhere in the soil, and when they do find water, they can only absorb it effectively if the water potential in the roots is lower than the water potential in the soil. Because water will flow from high potential to low potential, the high water potential typically found in sandy or rocky soils allows water to move into the roots, which, uh, relatively speaking, have a lower internal water potential. Biochemically, this is kind of like water running downhill. It's going from high to low potential. Now, this isn't necessarily the case with silt-rich water, as the huge amount of solutes in the form of sediment and uh, debris drastically lowers the water's potential. Very dry soils are also difficult for plants to handle, because in dry soils, water will first want to stick to the dry mineral and soil particles. The lack of soil saturation means that water is retained through tension on the soil particles, and so the roots really struggle to absorb it. Only when the soil has been decently saturated will the water potential rise, and the water will begin to flow into the root tissue. In these cases, where the external water potential is very low, like in a desert or a, uh, in the soil during a drought, the plants can even be exposed to danger, as a low enough external water potential will actually start to suck water out of the plant's roots and back into the ground. Above the ground, the plant's shoot is exposed to the air. Water also exists in the air as water vapor, and even this has a water potential that plays a role in plant hydration. When it's warm and dry outside, the water inside the plant's leaves exists at a much higher water potential than the water vapor in the air outside. 
The inside of the leaf is a hydrated, humid place, so air that isn't humid will necessarily have a lower water potential. And because water flows from high to low potential, this will take the vapor out of the leaf and suck it into the dry air of the external environment, of the atmosphere. When it's humid outside, the water potential of the air is closer to that inside the leaf. And so, when it's really humid outside, the rate of transpiration isn't as fast, because that, that potential isn't as strong. It's the difference between water flowing quickly down a steep hill, as opposed to water flowing very slowly across a flat plain. The relative differences in water potential, the, the differences between high and low potential, determines the rate of flow of the water. Consider the fact that this sets up a water potential gradient along the entire height of the plant. In the soil, where all of the free-range water is, the water potential is really high. This means there's a lot of water here. It's wet. Anything stuck into the ground is going to get wet. And it just so happens that the plant grows roots, which stick into the ground. And because of the slightly lower water potential in the roots, they will absorb water out of the ground and bring it into the plant's body. The leaves of the plant have a water potential that's much lower than the roots, and the air outside the leaves has an even lower water potential. The real magic happens when water moves between these two realms, between the ground and the roots, and the leaves and the sky. At the root, the water is absorbed, and it moves through the cells of the cortex. Water molecules are small enough that they can move through the phospholipids in the cell's membrane. It can be channeled through the cytoplasm of the cells, which are all connected through protein channels and pores and stuff like that. And the water can even flow through the porous cell walls. All of this water is moving to the center core of the root, to the vascular tissue. And all of the cortex cells that the water moves through act like a, like a filter, and it moderates the incoming solutes, so that the water that finally makes it to the vascular system at the core of the root has a controlled, regulated solute concentration that won't damage the plant. Another way that plants regulate this water balance is with an evolved layer called the Casparian strip. The endodermal cells that line the vascular bundles secrete a waxy substance called suberin into their cell walls, and all of this suberin secretion forms a watertight seal. Now, this also prevents water from flowing through the cells, so as to make the cells and their membranes the only way for water to enter or leave the vascular bundle. Once the water has passed the Casparian strip, the water will flow into the phloem and the xylem, which are the vasculatory cells that enable further water transport. In smaller plants, a phenomenon called root pressure is sufficient to push water up and out of the plant. At night, when there's no photosynthesis and no open stomata, water flow through the plant's tissues is diminished. But the roots don't need sunlight to accumulate nutrients, and when they do, they fill their cells with solutes. This causes water to flow into the root cells, and the roots expand with water until they reach a decently high internal pressure. This water pressure within the roots builds up, until it starts to push water up the stems to the leaves. This results in a process called gutation, wherein root pressure pushes water up and out of the roots, through the plant and out of its leaves. So if you look at small plants, like grasses or small bushes, early in the morning, you might see little water droplets on the ends or the tips of their leaves. This is the gutation, caused by root pressure pushing water up through the leaves and out of the plant's body. Water has several physical properties that allow it to be siphoned up through the plant's body like this. These physical properties of water are called adhesion, cohesion, and surface tension, and they all play a role in this passive movement of water up through the plant's body. So adhesion is a quality that's created by the hydrogen bonds that transiently form as different molecules come into contact with each other. If you look at how water acts when you have it in a glass cup, you'll see that water rises up in a slope as it approaches the inner side of the glass. This is the adhesion of billions of hydrogen bonds, pulling a little rim of water up against the force of gravity. 
This same phenomenon occurs in the cellular pipes of vascular plants. The cellular vessels and capillary tubes interact with the water through adhesion. Now, cohesion is the attraction between similar molecules, like the transient hydrogen bonds that form between water molecules. When adhesion pulls some water up the sides of the container, the force of cohesion pulls up the rest of the water column below the surface. These forces in a tube together create a meniscus at the interface of air and water, which is when the water at the rim is held up by adhesion and cohesion, while gravity pulls down the water in the middle and makes the middle of the surface of the water a little concave depression. And surface tension is the force that pulls across the surface to minimize surface area. Surface tension thus fights against gravity to lift up the center of the meniscus. When you're talking about water flow through cylinders like those you'd use in a typical lab, like a, a graduated cylinder you would use to measure out some kind of solution, these effects are plainly visible. But on their own, they don't really work to get the water up very high. They don't pull the water up through the graduated cylinder. The water just sits there. However, when the water is flowing through the plant's vasculature, the water is being moved up extremely tiny pipes, pipes that are so small that they're composed of single-file columns of cells. In these extremely confined tubes, these three properties of water, adhesion, cohesion, and surface tension, work together to fight against gravity and lift the water tens and hundreds of meters into the air. The adhesion first pulls up against the edges of the vessel elements, and when the sun causes the upper portion of the water to heat up and transpire away, this creates deep menisci that are filled as cohesion brings up the water column. The surface tension in such a small space pulls the center of the meniscus up and further raises the water level. As long as there's sunlight, the process kind of sustains itself in a form of perpetual tension. As long as the leaves have a low water potential and the air outside has an even lower water potential, the tension at the water-air interface will passively pull water up through the plant in a continuous stream. This is a solar-powered process, as the drying out of the leaves perpetuates the tension. It continually pulls the water up. Through cohesion of the water molecules in this continuous water column, this tension can reach all the way from the leaves down to the roots. A long time ago, millions of years ago, there was a really important evolutionary event that enabled vascular plants to grow really tall. Even though there's this neat little cellular trick that vascular plants use to pull up water against the force of gravity, the water still has mass. Water is heavy and a continuous stream of water running through a plant, well, that composes a lot of water. The herbaceous plants are quite limited in size because their soft tissues just can't support the weight of too much water. But then a molecule called lignin emerged in the cell walls of plants, who today incorporate lignin into their secondary cell walls to create hard, dense, woody tissue. This evolution of lignin and the evolution of much greater structural support in the plant's tissues allowed the plants to hold much more water. They could hold up much more weight. And soon, there were species of woody shrub and tree that reached high into the sky, all because they had the hard, sturdy, lignin-reinforced tissue to do it. This continuous flow of water across the potential gradient can only be upheld as long as there's a continuous supply of water. When plants start to feel water stress, they can't keep up this continuous flow, and the solute potential in their cells and tissues drops, and the whole plant begins to lose turgor pressure and wilts. To prevent the total collapse of the water column, the plant will activate numerous defenses. For example, plants will close their stomata to lower the rate of transpiration. But this has a secondary effect in that it prevents carbon dioxide from being absorbed by the leaf, and this interferes with the sugar production of photosynthesis. The closing of stomata also prevents gas exchange, so oxygen that's produced by uh, photosynthesis can't be released back out into the atmosphere. 
This relationship between water conservation mechanisms and the gas exchange that's necessary for photosynthesis is called the photosynthesis transpiration compromise. The plants have to manage this compromise in such a way that they don't run out of water and so that they don't totally shut down their photosynthesis. So then, that raises the question. How do plants prevent water loss and maintain a continuous water flow, especially when they live in dry climates with dry soils and a lot of sunlight? Some plants, like spruce trees and pine trees, have evolved needles instead of leaves. These needles have a smaller surface area, and so there's less surface available for transpiration. So overall, this helps the evergreen trees conserve water. If you were to take one of the needles from these evergreen trees and look at it in your hand and feel it, you would notice that it has like a thin outer layer, like a thin sheath of some kind. And this is another feature that's common to all sorts of plants, called a cuticle. The cuticle is a waxy layer that's secreted by the epidermal cells, and it creates this waterproof layer between the outer cells and the air. The cuticle is useful because it protects the leaves from undue water loss. But the plant also has to be pretty careful with how it secretes its cuticle, because if it covers too many of its stomata with the cuticle, it'll suffocate itself, like a person with a plastic bag covering their head. Alright, so we got the cuticle, I've mentioned and explained the stomata. There's also an adaption to dry air, one that I think is particularly fascinating. And this is where the stomata are clustered on the underside of the leaves. Particularly, they're clustered in these little bowl-shaped depressions, or cavities in the tissue. So the, the actual stomata pore themselves are positioned at the bottom of these little cavities. All of these little pockets, or craters, that run along the underside of the leaves that house the stomata, they all have little hairs, called trichomes, ringing the opening. These little trichome hairs protect the pocket, and they create a tiny microclimate of still air. Because the stomata are exposed to this semi-controlled microclimate, the rate of transpiration can be suppressed, compared to the stomata that aren't protected by these microclimates. This transpiration photosynthesis compromise can be pretty tricky to balance. This flow of air through the stomata can't be entirely closed off, though because carbon dioxide needs to keep flowing into the plant so that it can conduct photosynthesis and produce carbohydrates, like starch and cellulose. Some plants utilize a hyper-efficient form of photosynthesis, called C4 photosynthesis, which prioritizes the accumulation of carbon dioxide into bundle sheath cells, which exist deep inside the leaf tissue and away from any stomata that might leak the carbon dioxide back out into the atmosphere. Other plants use a biochemical pathway called CAM, or CAM, which I've mentioned once before on the podcast. CAM stands for Crassulation Acid Metabolism, which kind of describes the process. The CAM plants will only open their stomata at night, when it's cool and dark, and so transpiration is slow. The carbon dioxide that's accumulated during the night is chemically associated with various acids, and during the day, when photosynthesis starts up again, the acids will release the carbon into the Kelvin cycle, where it will then get processed into sugars. All of these sugars are dissolved in the water and transported through the vascular tissue as well, as the sugars produced in the leaves have to go all over the plant's body, especially down to its roots, so that they can all grow. The movement of sugar through the plant can be understood through a system of sugar sources and sugar sinks, or areas where sugar is produced and areas where sugar goes to be stored or consumed. At the beginning of the growing season, as the plant is awakening from its winter dormancy or returning to life after its dry season nap, any sugar that's stored in tubers will get immediately tapped to fuel the initial growth of this new growing season. The tubers are sugar sources, and all of the newly awakened, rapidly growing tissue, like all of the new leaves, are the sugar sinks. During the growing season itself, the photosynthetic tissue in the stem, and in all of the leaves, become sugar sources. With the ample sunlight during the summer, or the wet season, 
these tissues are photosynthesizing a ton of sugars, far more sugar than the leaves or the stem actually needs for its own growth and sustenance. The excess sugar will get shuttled around to the structures that need it, but aren't themselves producing sugar. So this is structures like the apical meristems, where all of the new cellular division is happening, the storage structures like tubers that exist in the roots and underground shoots, and the sugar-rich reproductive structures like fruit and seeds. Where water moves from high water potential in the roots to low water potential in the leaves, the sugar will move from high solute concentration in the sugar sources to the low solute concentration found in sugar sinks. The phloem that connects the sources in the sinks is often dependent on the location of each. For example, leaves on the lower half of the tree typically send their sugars down to the roots, while leaves on the upper parts of the tree will send their sugars to the new leaves that are growing beside them in the canopy. Further still, Specific leaves will only feed sugars to the leaves nearest them, or on their side of the plant. This location-specific distribution of sugar is the result of the structure of the phloem. The phloem is composed of two types of cells, called sieve tube elements and companion cells. The sieve tube elements are really simple structures, to the point that they're hardly even cells anymore. They have cell walls, which give them their distinctive shape and strength, and they're connected to other sieve tube elements above and below them through sieve plates, which are flat plates that are perforated with holes, which provide a direct connection between the membranes and the cytoplasm of the sieve tube elements. But besides this, they don't really have any organelles. They don't even have nuclei. For all intents and purposes, they're just empty tubes with an inner membrane lining. Now, the companion cells are wrapped around these sieve tube elements, and unlike their sieve tube friends, the companion cells are packed with organelles. The companion cells are so named because they compensate for the sieve tube elements by packing in extra mitochondria, extra ribosomes, extra nuclei, and organelles, and all sorts of that kind of thing to help support and grow the sieve tube elements. The sugar fills the sieve tubes along with water from the xylem, and this creates a sugary sap that moves through the plant, with independent phloem connections between particular sugar sources and particular sugar sinks. This sugary solution is propelled not by transpiration, but by differences in turgor pressure between cells at the source and cells at the sink. Also unlike the flow of water up a tree, sugar transport does require an energy input. It's not passive. It requires an active energy investment. So at the sugar source, sugars like sucrose are being created and diffusing across the companion cells into the sieve tube elements. This increases the solute concentration within the sieve tube elements, and that, in turn, pulls water out of the xylem. The water flows into the sieve tube elements in an attempt to lower the solute concentration and establish equilibrium, but this just creates a strong turgor pressure in the cells of the tissue at the sugar source. At the sink, where there isn't that much sugar at all because it's using up all the sugar to grow or to generate energy or something like that, the opposite is happening. The tissue is actively pumping or passively sucking sugar out of the sieve tube elements and into the growing tissue. This pulls solutes out of the sugar sap in a process called phloem unloading, and it lowers the overall solute concentration. A lower solute concentration will encourage water to leave the sieve tube elements near the sugar sinks, and so at the sugar sinks, the water will flow back into the xylem. So phloem is under pressure, basically, and this propagates the movement of sugar sap throughout the plant's body. But to begin this process and create the gradient in the first place, the plant has to move sugar from the sugar source into the phloem. During the middle of a hot, sunny summer day, when a leaf is photosynthesizing at its maximal rate, it's producing a lot of sugar. In this circumstance, the cells in the source tissue, the leaf, are packed with sugar, and it flows out into the sieve tube elements through simple diffusion across the cytoplasm, and through pores between the cells. 
But when the leaves and the other sugar sources aren't operating at full capacity, they can't necessarily rely on simple diffusion. The plant has to actively pump sugars into the sieve tube elements. So much so that all of this active pumping raises the solute concentration of the sieve tube cells and keeps it high so as to bring in water from the xylem and then establish the high pressure end of the gradient. This active pumping is established through a system of protein pumps and protein channels. First, a protein pump in the membrane of a companion cell will consume ATP to pump out hydrogen ions, or protons. It'll pump them out of the cell. So this process burns chemical energy to increase the ion concentration of protons outside of the companion cell. And this establishes an electrochemical gradient, wherein the protons want to flow with the concentration gradient back into the cell. This gradient of proton flow is exploited by other protein complexes, called symporters, to shuttle other molecules into the cell against their concentration gradient. I talked about all of this a lot more in my episodes on biomolecules, and again in my episode on metabolic energy and enzymes, but I know that this might get kind of confusing. So let me try to simplify it. You have a membrane with a symporter protein embedded within it. Outside of the cell, there's a lot of protons, and only a little bit of sugar. But inside the cell, there's a lot of sugar, and only a few protons. The proton concentration gradient, going from high to low, thus will see the protons wanting to move into the cell. But the sugar's concentration gradient runs in the opposite direction. The sugar is at high concentration within the cell and at low concentration outside the cell. If it were left to simple diffusion, the sugar would try to reach equilibrium by leaving the cell. This is a problem when you want to load sugar into the cell so as to create a pressure gradient in the phloem. The symporter protein will thus tap the energy in the proton gradient to bring a sugar molecule into the cell against its concentration gradient. Because these symporters bring sugar into the companion cells, the sugar has a direct route into the sieve tube elements. The sugar has been loaded into the phloem, and it's now traveling through the vasculature to a sugar sink. At the sink, the phloem needs to be unloaded of its sugar content. When the sink is rapidly growing tissue, like new leaves that are using the carbon in cellular respiration, and for the physical construction of biomolecules, like proteins and carbohydrates, the sugar is unloaded through simple diffusion. The sugar-hungry leaf tissue sucks up all of the sugar that it can get from the phloem, and so the unloading process is passive and requires zero energy input. However, the process works differently at sugar sinks where there's no growth, but only sugar that's being loaded up into storage. These create points of highly concentrated sugar that have a concentration gradient taking them out of storage and out of their cells. So to prevent this, to keep the sugar in storage and prevent it from leaking back out, the plants will store the sugar in a large, empty organelle called a vacuole. The membrane of this vacuole is called a tonoplast, and it contains two specialized pumps. The first pump is used to move protons against their concentration gradient into the vacuole. The second pump uses those protons wanting to move back out of the vacuole with their gradient to pump a sugar molecule against its concentration gradient into the vacuole. By containing the sugar inside a compartment within a cell, the rest of the cell has a relatively low sugar concentration, and thus a low turgor pressure, which encourages the passive flow of sugar from the phloem into the sink cells. And by isolating the sugar, the sink cells maintain the pressure gradient in the phloem that supports this perpetual movement of sugar. And that is it for plant hydration. This was a pretty fun but pretty intense episode, and I hope you thought so too. I hope that I was able to effectively shed some light on how plants grow and hydrate themselves and how they move water against the force of gravity to seemingly impossible heights. If you found this episode particularly enjoyable or educational, then hit the like button. And if you like all of my content, then hit subscribe so you can see all the new stuff I post right when I post it. 
And if you're listening to this episode on iTunes, then be sure to leave a cool comment and give us a rating to help other people find the podcast and check it out. Now stay tuned for the next episode, where I'll be exploring plant nutrition. And as always, thanks for listening.